Hi, everyone. I'm Brian. I'm a postdoc at National Taiwan University, and I'm here to give a talk on dynamical stability and inverse mean curvature flow. So this isn't quite mean curvature flow, even though it's part of the special session on mean curvature flow. Uh, but if you study mean curvature flow, I think you might be interested. So um, this talk is going to consist of four parts. In the first part of the talk, I'm going to be giving background on inverse mean curvature flow and then uh, stating three big theorems. And in parts two, three, and four, I'm going to be proving each of those theorems. So if all you care about are results, then just part, watch part one. But I hope you care about more than the results and that you'll also watch parts two, three, and four. Let's begin. So everything that I'm going to be saying throughout this talk is for closed hypersurfaces in Euclidean space. So a pretty simple setup. And the definition of inverse mean curvature flow is it's a one parameter family uh, of immersions such that DDT of the uh, position vector is equal to one over the mean curvature uh, times the outward normal at each point. So if these flow surfaces are embedded, uh, take outward normal orientation. Um, and one important thing to highlight here is that if, uh, is that this equation right here, since the flow speed is one divided by H, only makes sense uh, if mean curvature is positive over each, uh, the image of each immersion. So um, you can't divide by zero, so you can't have zero mean curvature. So every, unlike with mean curvature flow, everything I'm going to be saying is for mean convex hypersurfaces in Rn plus one. Um, and we'd like to know things about the maximal solution uh, of uh, inverse mean curvature flow for some given initial data. Um, if you consider the image of some immersion F naught, what can you say about the corresponding solution F sub T to inverse mean curvature flow? Well, a good place to start is just see what happens to a round sphere. So if n naught is a round sphere of radius r, the corresponding solution to inverse mean curvature flow is a round sphere of radius r to the times e to the t over n. So inverse mean curvature flow, um, since the outward uh, normal component of flow speed is positive, is a strictly expanding flow, and it'll expand the radius of a sphere at a rate of e to the t over n. Now, this is actually based off of this single example, quite a different story from mean curvature flow because we see that finite time singularities do not need to happen. Um, of course, since the radius is e to the t over n, this flow is allowed to ex keep expanding forever. So uh, the question that this raises is for which solutions of inverse mean curvature flow do you have long time existence? Uh, and if that solution of inverse mean curvature flow has spherical topology, um, do the flow surfaces tend toward a round sphere at large times in the sense of some homothetic convergence? So these are the questions that we'll be focusing on through this talk. Uh, do finite time singularities happen? And if they don't, and the initial surface has spherical topology, will it converge to a round sphere after scale? at large times. Um, so the issue with approaching a problem like this is that all the evolution equations associated with inverse mean curvature flow uh, are fully nonlinear, well, at least for the position, are fully nonlinear. Um, and this makes dynamical stability results quite difficult. Um, unlike with mean curvature flow, you actually have a souped up reaction term in your reaction diffusion equations in inverse mean curvature flow. Um, but you also have a souped up diffusion term. Uh, so you have strong reaction terms, stronger reaction terms than in, than in mean curvature flow, but also ultra fast diffusion. So maybe there's hope that something good is going on with evolution. And indeed, there actually turns out to be a major result that um, guarantees long time existence and convergence for a general family of uh, hypersurfaces. So recall that a surface is star-shaped uh, if the normal component of its position vector is positive everywhere. 
Klaus Gerhardt showed in 1990 paper that the round sphere is stable under mean convex star-shaped perturbations. So if you take a knot to be a mean convex star-shaped hypersurface, uh, the maximal solution to inverse mean curvature flow will exist for all times, remain star-shaped, uh, and if you rescale each flow surface by e to the minus t over n, this is sort of the natural scale factor to choose in these problems. If you uh, rescale each flow surface by e to the minus t over n, <clears throat> the rescaled flow surfaces will converge to a round sphere in the sense that there exists uh, parameterizations uh, of each n tilde of t that um, converge as immersions in C infinity topology to the immersion of a round sphere. Um, so <clears throat> we know from Gerhardt's result that round spheres are dynamically stable under uh, inverse mean curvature flow, uh, under star-shaped perturbations and in inverse mean curvature flow. So we're curious about non-star-shaped perturbations. What can you say about non-star-shaped perturbations? So the first theorem that I'm going to be presenting on is about uh, sufficient conditions for uh, stability in inverse mean curvature flow. So if you know that a solution to inverse mean curvature flow exists for all times, uh, can you say whether or not the flow surfaces will always converge to a round sphere after scaling? Uh, it turns out that this is true as long as NT stays embedded. So in inverse mean curvature flow, even if your initial surface is embedded, uh, NT might not remain embedded. In many cases, it will be. But in general, the comparison principles for inverse mean curvature flow are weaker than for mean curvature flow. Um, so if you have these two things, if you have long time existence and embeddedness, you're automatically going to have convergence to a round sphere for any solution of inverse mean curvature flow. And actually, um, you can say something much more general. Uh, if a solution to inverse mean curvature flow exists for some minimal time that depends only on initial data and stays embedded for this time, then it actually must exist for all times and be star shaped by an explicit time. So the precise statement is the following. Let little r and big R be the in radius and out radius of a mean convex hypersurface. So I'm saying the radius of the largest ball enclosed by a surface n naught, and the smallest ball that, uh, sorry, other way around. R, little r is the radius of the largest ball that n naught encloses. Big R is the radius of the smallest ball that encloses n naught. These are called the in radius and out radius of uh, a surface. And let T star equal four times the dimension times the natural log of big R over little r. If you take the corresponding maximal solution to inverse mean curvature flow, and it exists for a time greater than T star, um, then, and uh, also each flow surface is embedded between zero and T star, that is telling you that um, the solution actually must exist forever and be star shaped by an explicit time. So in other words, <clears throat> um, you can, measure how long it takes for inverse mean curvature flow to make a non-star-shaped surface into a star-shaped one in terms of that surface's C0 deviation from a round sphere. This quantity T star is zero exactly when uh, n naught is a round sphere. So what this is telling you is that um, if n naught is close to a round sphere in some C0 sense, but it's not star-shaped, inverse mean curvature flow will make it star-shaped very quickly. Um, now, a singularity or a finite or a self-intersection could happen uh, before the surface becomes star-shaped. But if one, but if neither of those happens, um, then Gerhardt's results take over and you get long time existence and um, convergence to a sphere at large times. So this uh, theorem is telling you that uh, you can estimate how long it takes for a non-star-shaped solution to inverse mean curvature flow to become star-shaped. And as a corollary, if you have existence and embeddedness for some 
uh, minimal time than you have existed, existence, existence, embeddedness, and convert, and for all times, and also convergence back to a round sphere at large times. So the second thing that I'd like to talk about is applying theorem A to prove a specific dynamical stability results. Um, so uh, a, the, a family of surfaces that have received lots of attention under mean curvature flow are rotationally symmetric surfaces. These are surfaces that have symmetry about some axis uh, in Rn plus one. Uh, if you want to understand singularities of mean curvature flow better, this is a good place to start. So um, if you have a dumbbell shape and you evolve it by some expanding flow like inverse mean curvature flow, what will happen? Do you get some sort of finite time singularity or do you have long time existence? Um, what I show in my second theorem is that you don't get any finite time singularities. And uh, according to theorem A, you actually get um, stability. So, uh, well, what I said is not known to be true yet for general rotationally symmetric perturbations of the round sphere. Uh, but if you take a rotationally symmetric surface that has satisfies some additional curvature assumption, if you assume, uh, so I think this takes a little bit more explaining, Take a rotationally symmetric surface with spherical topology and uh, any point on the surface, n minus one of its n principal curvatures are all the same. They all correspond to rotation. Um, <clears throat> so let's call that principal curvature P. P is the principal curvature in directions of rotation. P is constant precisely when n naught is a sphere. So basically, you can um, say something about dynamical stability and rotationally symmetric uh, inverse mean curvature flow if this quantity P does not vary too much over the surface. So if the ratio of the maximum and minimum values of P is smaller than n to the power of n over 2 times n minus 1, um, then you can obtain all the same results that Gerhardt got long time existence, embeddedness, and convergence back to a round sphere at large times. So we do have dynamical stability uh, in rotationally symmetric solutions if you assume an extra curvature assumption. Uh, what you can think of this curvature assumption as doing is controlling the shape of the necks. Basically, um, surfaces that satisfy this condition, their necks cannot get too thin or narrow. Um, now, there are still non-star-shaped surfaces that satisfy this curvature condition. Think of a surface whose neck is very long. Uh, that will fail to be star-shaped. Um, but I think, ultimately, it's possible to remove this curvature condition. I will be presenting the theorem uh, with this condition in mind. Though. So, we know a sufficient condition for dynamical stability. We know an explicit non-star shaped family of surfaces, uh, which are dynamically stable under, uh, for which the round sphere is dynamically stable under inverse mean curvature flow. Uh, what else can we do with all of these results? Um, well, it turns out that there's some relationship between um, inverse mean curvature flow and the mathematics of soap films. So um, two old questions in minimal surface theory ask if the global area minimizer of a Jordan curve in R3 is embedded, and also how many minimal disks that Jordan curve bounds. So this is something that I just uh, learned not too long ago, but it's possible for some Jordan curve in R3 that the solution to Plateau's problem self-intersects. And uh, there's actually been quite a lot of work done going back to like the 70s on determining when you can say that this doesn't happen, that the solution to Plateau's problem does not uh, self-intersect. And the question of finiteness uh, for number of stable minimal disks bounded by the same curve is also uh, a very old question. So inverse mean curvature flow has something to say about these problems. Um, uh, it's very natural to take uh, a Jordan curve, an R3, which is confined to some mean convex surface. 
So let's take a Jordan curve in R3 that lies on some mean convex surface. You can say something about the minimal surfaces of the Jordan curve when this uh, surface M0 gives rise to a global embedded solution of inverse mean curvature. So theorem C uh, is about the embeddedness and finiteness of area minimizers. Let's say you have a domain in R3 with C2 mean convex boundary, and let uh, gamma be a Jordan curve on the boundary of E0. If uh, N0 uh, equal to the boundary of E0 uh, gives you a long time embedded solution of inverse mean curvature flow, you can say that the uh, solution to Plateau's problem for gamma is embedded, and that if you have a little bit more regularity on gamma, if it's at least of class C4 alpha, then it'll bound only finitely many stable minimal disks with areas less than K for any choice of real number K. So in other words, you get embeddedness for the global area minimizer and like quasi-finiteness for number of stable minimal disks if gamma lies on a mean convex surface and that mean convex surface gives you a global embedded solution to inverse mean curvature. So it might be a little bit mysterious why I uh, consider n naught to be the boundary of a domain e naught. Um, basically, this theorem is kind of a corollary of work that was done uh, on minimal surfaces earlier by uh, William Meeks and S.T. Yao. I'll explain um, more in part four. But as it is, this is just kind of a neat little thing that you can do with inverse mean curvature flow. Uh, an interesting little link back. Um, once you know the Meeks Yao results, uh, which are much harder to obtain, the um, uh, the result follows like pretty simply. Um, so I'm going to be uh, talking in part C about this, or in part four about this theorem. And now we know something about Jordan curves on rotationally symmetric and star shapes. So uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next